Hey everyone, in January I usually have a really good reading month because I start off really motivated. Um, I always set my reading goal pretty high. Um, I am eternally in search of beating my my personal best, which was in 2016. I read about 170 books. Um, I have not been able to recreate that <laughs> for various reasons. So usually in January, I start off with that mindset where um, at the beginning of the year, I'm really motivated. Um, I read 12 books this January and typically I read closer to 20 just because of that motivation factor, which I know is sort of ridiculous. 2023 is the year of reasonable goals <laughs> for me, I think. So some of these books I talked about in my previous video where I'm trying to get used to speaking to a camera again, but I'm gonna try to do um, a little bit better of a job of talking about those books in particular because I definitely was, yeah, still feeling a bit camera awkward, not camera shy, just camera awkward. Um, you'll probably notice a few things about this video that are different that I have never done before. So I have new technology, I have new software, I'm like doing all these different things, I'm experimenting, seeing what works. So we're just gonna go with it for now and see, again, it's, I mean, it's February 2nd now, but I'm still like writing that beginning of the year motivation train. So the first book that I finished in 2023 was the book of Form and Emptiness by Ruth Ozeki. And this book is about a mother and son, Annabelle and her son, Benny. And prior to the events of this book beginning, their animal's husband, um, Benny's father, is killed in an accident and we're sort of seeing the repercussions of that how they deal with grief it is biracial because his mother uh, annabelle was white and his father was korean and japanese they have these sort of parallel lives and experiences um annabelle doesn't really have many connections to other people she works from home and this is occurring i want to say late 90s early 2000s so she works from home and there's a lot of changes in dealing with like physical newsprint um, switching to online like digital media and then at the same time benny is you know dealing with the fact that he can hear objects <laughs> so um it's not that these objects like are speaking to him directly. Um, it's more that they are saying things. Um, he can hear them expressing themselves. It really bothers him because obviously nobody else can hear these things. So we have both Benny and Annabelle dealing with the grief and dealing with the this shift in the way that we think about objects and the roles that they play in our lives. Annabelle starts hoarding objects um, at the same time that she's reading this book about being a minimal minimalist and, you know, sort of cleaning and getting rid of objects that really hold no value to you. I did end up giving this book five stars because it was a book, I really appreciate books where you can read them at, on multiple levels depending on really what your preference is or even what your mental capacity is at that moment. So what I mean by that is if you're in the mood for something that's very character driven, then these are very richly drawn characters um, with Annabelle and Benny, but then also some of the um, side characters are also really great. So we have a, a woman uh, who calls herself the Aleph, who Benny has this huge crush on um, and seems to like have a very transient lifestyle. And then uh, a man who this sort of group of, I don't know how to describe <laughs> this group of like marginalized people, homeless people, people with mental health issues, like people who have not really been served, I guess, by the current systems in place. So there's this character who um, all of those others kind of revolve around. If you like themes, right? If you want to be a little bit more philosophical or, you know, get into some really deep ideas about life, then you could definitely read the book for that because there are a lot of questions about objects and the roles that they play in our lives. The, the plot, I would say, is the one thing that it doesn't really have going for it but everything else is so strong that it doesn't really need to in my opinion the second book i read in january was the immortal life of henrietta lax by rebecca sklute and yeah so this came out in 2010 it's been a new york times bestseller for like almost that entire time um but it's a non-fiction about um this woman who 
ended up having cervical cancer and the doctor who um, like diagnosed her and was treating her took some cells from her cervix and those cells ended up generating generations worth of research and treatments. This is a, a black family and there are a lot of you know questions of like ethics in them having taken these cells from her um, without really telling her and then that's that issue of ethics in medicine and science and research really continues with her family because all of these people around them understand the impact of what was taken from her uh, from their mother they don't really understand how it impacts them they don't ask understand the questions being asked of them you know a lot of people just are not interested in communicating with the family about these kinds of things i can completely see why this book like why it's been a bestseller for so long why it got made into a movie and yeah i really loved it i actually i read it because this semester i am teaching uh, classes on science writing and so i wanted to to start immersing myself in that. The next book that I read was A Restless Truth by Freya Marski and this is the second book in a series. I forget again what the actual series is called. In the first book one of the main characters was Robin and now in the second book we follow his sister Maud and she is on a ship with um, a woman who she's supposed to be sort of like the, the companion to this older woman and this older woman gets killed on the ship and she owned like she had something super powerful in her possession this is a fantasy so this object um, was magical the object goes missing and so Maud has to try to figure out who killed this woman that she was traveling with and where this object went so there are a few different characters in here who end up helping Maud out and it's a really just it's really fast paced. I recommend this for people who like fantasy but don't want a ton of world building that's like really overwhelming. The next book I read was Boy Parts by Eliza Clark and our main character Irina she is a photographer and she takes rather exploitative photos of men and she finds that it's very easy for her to do this because she is conventionally attractive and thin. And so she has no real difficulties sort of wielding that as a form of power. But then she is always frustrated in her attempts to kind of continue to exert any sort of power over people because of the way that they continually try to define her and effectively put her into certain categories or into certain boxes and then once they have done that they sort of dismiss her you know she has a certain accent so they assume that they know a lot about her background or her upbringing her class they know what school she went to what kind of art she does they see what she looks like physically so there are all these ways that other people are kind of simultaneously letting that letting her take advantage of them while also not taking her seriously there are a lot of triggers in this book it's very violent book obviously just from the premise you can tell probably that it's quite disturbing but I would highly recommend if you want if you don't mind darker fiction like that and if you are also a fan of books that make commentary on issues like gender dynamics and power dynamics uh, and class I always feel when I'm reading books like this that I'm missing out on a little bit of the the meaning because I'm not British <laughs> because I can just tell from reading these books that when people hear a specific accent there are a lot of class implications um, behind that and as an American who doesn't one recognize um, those class distinctions like I'm just not familiar with them but two as somebody who you know just as a culture I just don't think we put as much emphasis on social class I always just feel like I'm kind of missing something from um, books like that but that's not the only kind of commentary that Clark is making so it's not like it's inaccessible or anything like that I did reread a book I reread A Court of Wings and Ruin and I listened to this on audio I'm not really going to talk about it that much because honestly I'm just tired of it. I am so tired of like the fandom and stuff and I initially was doing this reread because I felt like it might kind of spark 
my joy in the series a little bit you know the joy that the fandom has tried really really hard to suck out of that series in the past couple of years it did work for a little bit but i also just think that i have other priorities i stopped listening at about halfway through because i just it's not my favorite of the series it's really hard to read that series without any like baggage attached anymore. Uh, the next book then that I read after that was The River of Silver by S.A. Chakraborty and this is part of the Diababad series. This is a collection of short stories uh, that go along with that trilogy and before each chapter there is a little description of when it fits into the chronology of the original. Um, it definitely focuses more on side characters. So our original sort of main trio, uh, Nari, Ali, and Dara, they are not featured very heavily, which makes complete sense. You know, the, the original trilogy really focused on them. So some of the other characters get the spotlight quite a bit more, which I really enjoyed. I DNF'd quite a bit this month. I've been more comfortable with DNFing books lately when i am just not into it i don't want reading to feel like a chore and i initially had some guilt around that because i spent the money on this and i don't want to like ever you know leave a bad review just because i'm feeling bitchy or something but i'm also just trying to remember that this is something i'm doing for fun so with that said i read M majority of the last white man by mohsin uh, hamid and this is as you can tell it's a very short book about a man called anders who wakes up in it's some in an unnamed country he wakes up one morning and he is no longer white his skin has turned brown and so he's sort of having a crisis trying to figure out what happened and it's it was a really really interesting premise other people also start to basically it's not that they like turned into a different specific race so much as they like lost their whiteness and so the premise of this was really fascinating and i did enjoy it for the beginning for that for what it was um, because you see him go through the process of trying to explain this to the one person friend that he tells i'm um, telling his father and you know trying to go to work go to the store this is the reason why it was i did enjoy it at first because it started off strongly to me it started off with you know his sort of waking up like what is going on and then he goes to the store and he's like over analyzing every interaction that he has with white people i'm um, trying to figure out like is this racism like are they treating me this way because i don't seem like a white person anymore so it was a really interesting exercise in that sense i just ended up not really being able to finish it because it felt like that's all it was really i wasn't really invested in where the story was going so i just stopped <laughs> i read then after that layla and the blue fox and this is a middle grade novel um, written by a husband and wife, um, Kieran Millwood Hargrave and Tom DeFreston. Kieran Millwood Hargrave um, was the author and then her husband did the illustrations for this book, which I'm going to show you a little bit of what this book looks like on the inside. So this it was based on a true story about a, a fox who traveled across the Arctic. The journey of this fox is framed as sort of a metaphor um, for Layla and her mother. So they were refugees from Syria. Uh, Layla li now lives in London, but her mother lives, um, I wanna say in Sweden, I could be wrong, doing um, scientific research. Not only was this book really beautiful, I thought it did such a great job of considering issues like creating a new home and, and who your family is if you move or if you're separated from them, like how you can maintain family or find new home when you have to when you're forced to leave it was really heart-wrenching sometimes to see the way that Layla would react to her mother because she perceived her mother as not really caring about her despite everything that they had gone through and so that's all kind of the emotional stuff going on in the background while Layla and her mother are following this fox across the Arctic. So next up in books that I did not finish is Maps of Our Spectacular Bodies by Maddie Mortimer. And this is another one where I read it because of a book prize. This was listed, I wanna say. I can't remember if it was long listed or short listed for the Booker Prize last year. 
and this had some really interesting things going on. So I did DNF this book, but I have to add in the caveat that I know I recognize that it was really beautifully written. I think it might have been one of those things of like, it's not you, it's me at this moment and I just couldn't like fully get engaged in this book and invested in it. So it centers around a woman named Leah and she has a husband, Harry, and then a daughter, uh, Iris. And she also has found out that her, she has cancer and it is, has returned. Like I said, the writing in this book was really beautiful and evocative. I can definitely see that some people would think it was overwritten. Um, I didn't personally, but it's told in a few different styles. So we have the current day where Leah is trying to be a mother and a wife and also uh, go through her cancer treatments. We also have uh, a narrative following Leah when she is a teenager and she has this really like tumultuous relationship with an older boy. She's like 14 and he's 19, I wanna say. And then living with her parents, um, her father is like a minister or preacher. So it's a very like religious household. And then the third narrative strand that we have going through there is from the perspective of illness, of her cancer. Cancer is kind of narrating um, from its own perspective. Similar to The Last White Man, I enjoyed it for what it was intellectually. And I did like the writing in Maps of Our Spectacular Bodies quite a lot. I just couldn't get into it. So I, I wanna say I made it like 150 pages or so. There's sometimes comes a point in a book when I'm reading and I just realize I cannot continue with this. This just isn't really for me. I can see why other people would like it. It's just not something that I wanna spend my time on. Now in a complete tone shift, <laughs> I read uh, Financial Feminist by Tori Dunlap. I mean, you can probably tell what this book was about just from the cover and the title. I don't read a whole lot of like personal finance, like self-help type book things. It's just, it's never really been my wheelhouse, but I'm trying to like, you know, get some things together. I personally found it helpful. Um, it didn't dumb things down, but it also didn't assume that you had a ton of knowledge. It had a nice middle ground and also considered different perspectives, different experiences um, and circumstances that would make, you know, some of the advice um, just need to like function differently for different people. So if that's the kind of content that you're interested in, I would recommend that book. Second to last book that I read was Best of Friends by Camilla Shamsi. And this is a story about two friends, Miriam and Zara. They grew up in Pakistan and Zara is a very traditional sort of well-behaved, gets good grades sort of girl and family isn't, they're not wealthy. They seem to be like pretty middle class from what I could tell. Miriam on the other hand is from a much wealthier family. They own a, a company, like a leather goods company. People often see Miriam as being much more like rebellious and just doesn't play by the rules nearly as much. The story switches back and forth between their childhood in Pakistan to their adulthood in London like 30 years later. So it switches from when they're about 15, 16 to when they're in their 40s. I did enjoy this book. I really love the characters. I love stories where it's a childhood friendship and it's told with the sort of wisdom and ability to reflect as an adult, um, especially, you know, when that friendship continues into adulthood and you see each other change. There is a particular incident that occurs when they are teenagers with a couple of males and the situation is sort of fraught with tension and their families get involved and there's like the potential for scandal and reputations being ruined and that event signals a real turning point in their lives. And so the book revolves around telling you know, what their friendship was like prior to that event and then how that unfolds and then what their relationship, their friendship is like as adults and how they view that event, you know, 30 years later. So then the last book that I read in January was Jade City by Fonda Lee and this was really great. So this came out in 2017 and I really enjoyed that book a lot. It's set in a fictional country where the only place in the world where jade, this certain kind of jade is produced or can be mined 
and this jade gives people magical powers. However, it only gives certain people magical powers. You have to be somebody from that country. And occasionally, for whatever reason they don't understand, even people from the country can't use its powers. We are seeing this country, I wanna say about like 50 or 60 years after a war has occurred and they have thrown off colonial rule, but there is still a lot of like colonizer influence in the country because of course this is the only place where you can get jade and so these other countries have a big interest in attaining that jade but then also figuring out how they can use it so that they can also you know access these powers though the city is ruled by a bunch of different gangs basically who control the distribution and possession, I suppose, of the jade. I read the, the author note at the end and I read all the, the research that she had done. She watched The Godfather, read, who is it, Mario, that author who writes like a bunch of crime gangster um, novels, did research on the mafia, like all kinds of things like that. So it's a really interesting blend of this like fantasy magic world with this somewhat recognizable influence of like post-colonial countries trying to like maintain and assert their own power but then also with this gang like mafia sort of um, situation going on. I was really invested in all of the characters right away. It did kind of throw you in in the deep end. It felt sort of cinematic while you were watching it or <laughs> It felt pretty cinematic uh, while I was reading it and so I could totally appreciate if this were ever made into a movie. I think it would be a great movie and I'm probably going to finish the series up in the next month or two. So those are all the books that I read in January. Um, let me know if you have read any of them, find any of them interesting. Some things are going to be changing a bit on my channel, you know, in the coming months hopefully just like with my reading I can keep up motivation. In the meantime I will see you in the next video. Bye!